Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Walter Matthau. Seldom in history has one man captured so completely the heart, the mind, and the imagination of a people as did General of the Army, Douglas MacArthur. In a military career that spanned more than half a century, he fought hard in the cause of freedom and justice. He was one of the most resourceful field commanders of his era, a brilliant chief of staff and a military governor whose wisdom and fairness have set new standards for military statesmanship. His campaigns in the Pacific will serve as models of strategy for generations of soldiers still unborn. His greatness as a strategist can be explained in one sentence. He attained his objective quickly, decisively, and with minimum American losses. The drama and excitement of his brilliant career was expressed in an historic speech he made before a joint session of Congress. Mr. Walter Cronkite, the noted commentator, now brings you the MacArthur story. I am closing my 52 years of military service. When I joined the Army, even before the turn of the century, it was the fulfillment of all my boyish hopes and dreams. The world has turned over many times since I took the oath on the plane at West Point. Indeed, much has happened to the world since Douglas MacArthur took the oath at West Point and in the wars and the periods of peace since, he has often been a central and dramatic figure. The beginning of an extraordinary career. Young Douglas with his father, General Arthur MacArthur, boy colonel in the Civil War, and veteran of the Philippine campaign in the Spanish-American War. One day when the son was 13 years old, his father is said to have remarked, I think there is the material of a soldier in that boy. A truth that was soon made clear. Entering West Point, he showed extraordinary brilliance in his studies, attaining an average that was the highest in a quarter of a century. And he won the coveted A in athletics as well. 25 years later, he was to lead the American team in the World Olympic Games. Meanwhile, the campaign in the Philippines was being brought to a successful completion under his father's able leadership. The son was eager to visit these battlefields, and after West Point, his first assignment was to survey areas of these islands. One of these was the Bataan Peninsula, where he was to fight many years later in a desperate but heroic struggle. A few months before the attack upon Pearl Harbor, MacArthur had been recalled to active service in the Philippines. On the day after Pearl Harbor, the Philippines, too, were under attack. At the beginning of World War I, the plan was to use only regular army divisions to oppose the powerful German army. Meanwhile, outside these divisions, America had many trained and able men. A proposal for a new division of National Guard units from as many states as possible was vigorously advocated by a Major Douglas MacArthur. Said he, it will spread over the whole country like a rainbow. The idea for the Rainbow Division, the 42nd, was his, and he worked constantly to see that the division was well trained and equipped for the raging battle that awaited it in France. Division moved up to the front. Its full readiness, through the efforts of Colonel MacArthur, the division's chief of staff, was to prove fortunate indeed. It was during this period, too, that an impressive battlefield tactician began to prove himself and to foreshadow a great military future. for brilliant decisions on the battlefield, Colonel MacArthur was also to gain a reputation as a man who faced danger completely unafraid. Before long, he was in command of the Rainbow Division, the youngest American division commander in the war. 
Twice wounded, twice gassed, he won more awards for valor than has ever been awarded to an American soldier. He was acclaimed by the Secretary of War and General Pershing as the greatest frontline general of the war. Returning to West Point, he became the youngest superintendent the academy had ever had. Here he broadened the curriculum to include a full college education and introduced a now widely followed program of intramural athletics. Today, here, he is a symbol and an inspiration. In 1930, MacArthur was appointed Chief of Staff with the rank of full general. During his term of office, much of his time was spent in building an army that had been pared down to only 60,000 combat soldiers, a most difficult effort when an attitude of pacifism dominated the nation. In keeping with his principle of examining the military situation at close range, he toured Europe to observe the forces of other nations. In France, he was recognized once more for his outstanding military contribution to the Allied cause. In Germany, he foresaw the build-up for war. Back home, he begged his country in Congress to realize that the United States was in danger. As chief of staff, he foresaw the need for a new type of army, mechanized, mobile, and insisted that our defense force become capable of rapid expansion. Recognizing his abilities, President Roosevelt broke precedent by reappointing the youngest chief of staff we have ever had to a second term. In the 20s, MacArthur had served in the Philippines, and in the 30s, he was asked to return as their military advisor. A deep mutual regard between the Filipinos and MacArthur grew during this period. It was the basis for a gallant defense that was to come. In 1935, he began a 10-year plan to build up the defense of the Philippines. In World War II, it was to be these forces that MacArthur would lead in a desperate fight, and on this ground. But now the leader, at 57, having served in the United States Army for 34 years, decided to retire. Four years later, it was as though his military career were just beginning. Months before the attack upon Pearl Harbor, MacArthur had been recalled to active service in the Philippines. On the day after Pearl Harbor, the Philippines, too, were under attack. Defense here was pitifully hampered by lack of men and planes. With his knowledge of past campaigns, particularly those of his father in this very area, MacArthur withdrew his meager forces into the mountains of the Bataan Peninsula. From the rocky fortress of Corregidor, he directed an operation as crucial as any in the war. This early campaign in the Philippines, the heroic fighting by a lonely army of Filipinos and Americans for almost half a year, caused a critical delay in the Japanese timetable of attack. Back at home, the leader of the first desperate ground fighting became a symbol to a nation just beginning to gird itself for all-out war. The people found in him what they were beginning to discover in themselves, a spirit of intense determination. Suddenly, MacArthur was ordered by President Roosevelt, who regarded him as our greatest general, to leave to carry on the fight from Australia.
Leaving the Philippines hurt him deeply. As always, he wished to be at the front, beside his comrades. When finally they were forced into the infamous march of death on Bataan, his promise to them was, I shall return. They believed him implicitly. Until his arrival in Australia, the plan had been to await the Japanese attack and prepare as well as possible. Then it became apparent that the new Southwest Pacific commander had another plan. He had meant exactly, I shall return. He was determined to carry the war to the enemy, to New Guinea, which was the direct route back to the Philippines. A long struggle lay ahead against huge numbers on countless islands. There seemed to be but one way, blast the enemy from every one of his island positions in the Pacific. Victories came, but they were costly. Was there some other way? Knowing the area, knowing the enemy, utilizing all our air and naval skill, the commander developed his plan to capture only a few key positions on the way to the Philippines. Now against these key positions, the pattern of attack. First, heavy preparatory fire to soften up the objective. unpredictable. In each case, the selection was dictated by strategy rather than by sympathetic terrain. There were many beaches. Some were ideal, hardly more than a matter of getting one's feet wet. Meanwhile, the gain was tremendous, the enemy never having expected us to come ashore here. There were other shores, many of them wicked. Sometimes the attack was in frail craft, sitting ducks for the enemy if surprise had not been accomplished. On another beach, amphibious tractors. Continually the envelopment, the flank attack, decisions, difficult ones, boldly made, based upon unique knowledge and experience. In addition, a mastery by MacArthur of combined operations of the three arms, the key to modern warfare. Leaders and men shared the glow of victory. Losses on the Allied side were relatively small since damaging frontal assaults were avoided. But thousands of Japanese prepared to fight to the death were rarely given this opportunity. Although many were captured, thousands more were isolated, their supply and communication lines destroyed. In the words of the strategist who conceived and carried out the plan, the main body of the enemy was left to wither on the vine. To the outside world, to many who saw the newsreels, the progress being made by the general was admired and applauded. But to those who understood MacArthur, they saw beneath every move his determination to return to the Philippines. This, to him, was a moral obligation. These islands, a second home and a place where he had left his comrades, were to be the springboard for ultimate victory over Japan. Invasions in the Southwest Pacific continued. To the commander, these hard-fought steps zigzagging along the coast of New Guinea were preliminaries, necessary ones. Finally, having gained the northwestern end of the island, with thousands of the enemy bypassed, there was no question in his mind as to the next objective. Aboard the battleship Missouri, an awesome ceremony was to take place, one which reflected the deep awareness of a great soldier, his understanding of war and peace, and the historic moment that this was. Lady Gulf, 
41 years before, as a newly commissioned engineer, Lieutenant MacArthur had made a survey of this area, its potentiality and needs in case of war. Now, two miles off the starboard, was Leyte again. Once more, the enemy had not been ready for an attack. The commander watched with growing gratification. With the help of guerrilla intelligence and sabotage, Americans held the beachhead, encircling and surprising the enemy. Now on the beaches of Leyte, a seemingly limitless supply of LSTs, men and equipment. The result of carefully laid plans. Directing the attack, the general seemed to be everywhere at once. Every day, at some point in the front lines, his men would spot the familiar faded field marshal's cap and the outsized corncob pipe. The landings at Leyte and Lingayen Gulf finally brought troops on the final difficult leg of the journey. On the road to Manila, where the going became more difficult, as the enemy threw in huge numbers of reinforcements in an all-out effort to halt the steady advance. There was no timetable now in MacArthur's mind, only that he must get to Manila without delay to rescue prisoners from the reported increasing savagery of the Japanese guard. In Manila, the fighting was block by block. Troops found what the leader had told them to expect. The enemy had dug in for a long siege. To the general, this was the return. This was the climax of the mission to which he was so deeply dedicated. And now, Corregidor. Stronghold, which early in the war had been so effective a fortress for withstanding attack, was now his. Finally, while civilians celebrated joyfully at one end of the city, and the enemy still fought bitterly at the other, MacArthur entered Manila. He had kept the soldiers' faith. Probably his greatest reward was the visit to prison camps. Santo Tomas, Belive, Cabana Tuan, Los Banos. A series of daring surprise raids had rescued every prisoner held by the Japanese. I'm a little late, he said, but we finally came. Once more, Corregidor and the Philippines were under an American flag. Then, suddenly and swiftly, the war against Japan was brought to a close. As the principal architect of the Pacific victory, credited by the Chief of Britain's wartime Imperial General Staff as the greatest general of the war, MacArthur was the natural choice as supreme commander to enforce the surrender terms. Aboard the battleship Missouri, an awesome ceremony was to take place, one which reflected the deep awareness of a great soldier, his understanding of war and peace, and the historic moment that this was. It is my earnest hope, and indeed the hope of all mankind, that from this 
solemn occasion, a better world shall emerge out of the blood and carnage of the past. A world founded upon faith and understanding. A world dedicated to the dignity of man and the fulfillment of his most cherished wish for freedom, tolerance, and justice. Let us pray that peace be now restored to the world and that God will preserve it always. These proceedings are closed. Now began one of the strangest occupations of any land by any conqueror. An idealist with firm convictions on the way democracy can be presented to Eastern peoples, MacArthur determined to guide the Japanese through a complete social revolution. While the emperor with his deep hold upon the people was retained, almost every other institution became affected by what was entirely new to the Japanese, Western democracy. The ideas caught on under the sure leadership of MacArthur. There was the enactment of a constitution and universal suffrage. The national diet, highest organ of state power, became responsible to the people. Monopolies were broken up. Land reform was instituted, which transformed tenants into owners. These rural capitalists became a strong bulwark against communism. In Japan, the social reforms urged by MacArthur proved one of the most successful experiments of history. An implacable enemy became a friend. During the occupation, the people took him to their hearts, and his family as well. His wife, she who had been beside her husband at Corregidor, and their young son, Arthur. The work of reform was going ahead when suddenly... A huge military force swept down from North Korea across the 38th parallel. Handfuls of Americans serving as occupation troops in Japan were flown into South Korea in a rapid show of strength, aimed at showing greater resources than actually were at hand. The strategy worked. The North Koreans ran into resistance, bogged down waiting for more troops and artillery, while reinforcements poured into South Korea to turn the tide of battle. During the ensuing months, General MacArthur guided the war as Commander-in-Chief of United Nations forces in Korea. Again, he studied the fighting at close range. A man in his 70s, visiting battlefields as dauntlessly as he had many years before, when a young officer in France. Then came the daring amphibious attack at Inchon, behind the enemy's lines on a shore that others had declared too risky. The landing was a complete surprise and success. The North Korean army was demoralized. The victory has become recognized as a masterpiece of strategy. Seoul returned to its rightful inhabitants. There had been a long line of cities and towns returned under MacArthur's leadership. It was at this time that President Truman cited MacArthur for his vision, his judgment, his indomitable will, his unshakable faith. The Korean War continued northward. The orders were the destruction of the North Korean armed forces. And then the Chinese communists entered the conflict, posing new questions in Washington, not only military, but political. While carrying out what he considered to be his duty as supreme commander, the pursuit of victory on the battlefield, General MacArthur came into conflict with those he served. 
His long and distinguished military career was suddenly brought to a close in an official order from the President, Commander-in-Chief of the Military Forces of the United States. He was homeward bound for the first time in 14 years. The San Francisco reception was the largest, the most vociferous the city had ever known. The hero was home from the wars of last and deserving the deepest respect and gratitude of the people he had served. In the midst of the ovation, the husband graciously acknowledged that he had not stood alone. That this is not only my beloved wife, but my best soldier. <laughs> In the nation's capital, greater than all the medals and honors of his career, was this final tremendous tribute. And then General MacArthur stepped down from the great panorama of history in which he had figured so brilliantly with a soldier's words spoken from a soldier's heart. The world has turned over many times since I took the oath on the plain at West Point and the hopes and dreams have long since vanished. But I still remember the refrain of one of the most popular barrack ballads of that day, which proclaimed most proudly that old soldiers never die. They just fade away. And like the old soldier of that ballot, I now close my military career and just fade away. An old soldier who tried to do his duty as God gave him the light to see that duty. Goodbye. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Walter Matthau. The deeds of the leader shall live and the hard-won glory of his exploits. This endures. This alone escapes the greedy destruction of death. This is certainly true of General George S. Patton. His electrifying dash through France and the invasion of Europe will live as long as courage is honored as a human virtue. Patton was a military hero in the classic tradition. He had all the fire, spirit, and daring of a medieval warrior on horseback. But more than that, he was a keen student of war and the psychology of war. His place is secure as one of the great generals of military history. Ronald Reagan will now narrate some of the thrilling moments from the life of General George S. Patton. said, the harder we push, the more Nazis we'll kill. And the more Nazis we kill, the fewer of our men will be killed. Pushing means fewer casualties. The third took the old man at his word and found he was right.
It's not easy to believe that George S. Patton Jr. was once just Georgie. From his earliest years, this lad believed he was going to be General George S. Patton Jr. His imagination was stirred by stories of great heroes of the past, told by his father. His military career began at VMI. At West Point, he proved himself a model cadet, although, like Washington and Napoleon, he could not spell. Rarely from this time on would Georgie flash this attractive smile. It just didn't go with his very serious ideas of soldiering. He established the first football team for soldiers to keep them from wasting their off hours in drinking and gambling. World War I. Convinced that this ponderous vehicle would someday come into its own, he studied it, rode into battle on it, became a hero alongside it. Our first tank commander, he would always be linked with the weapon that symbolized his driving, overwhelming personality. After the war, the tank school at Fort Meade. Two officers here shared a deep military interest, Ike Eisenhower and Georgie. The fierce expression, his get-up at masquerades, reflected some deep instinct to play the role of warrior or fighter. His wife joined in, sensing that even in fun, these roles suited her soldier husband. A time came as it had before when the clothing of battle was to be worn by millions of Americans. November 1942, in command of American forces for the invasion of North Africa, Lieutenant General George S. Patton, Jr. Outstanding features of a brief campaign was Patton's bold leadership and later the favorable impression he created on French and Arabs alike. Long range plans could now be discussed. Plans which would cast America's toughest general in a leading role. Meanwhile, a battle was raging to the east in Tunisia. to a pitch of fighting spirit enter the fray. Allied leaders such as General Alexander sensed Patton's remarkable military gifts, his judgment, his sure instinct for what the enemy would do. Patton set a tank trap for Rommel. Rommel marched right into it. His 10th Panzer Division lost half its 60 tanks, retired, and never attempted a counterattack. His reputation grew. He looked forward eagerly to his next campaign. He'd been selected to command a new army, the 7th, slated for the conquest of Sicily.
the day from Patton to his men. Remember that we as attackers have the initiative. We must retain this tremendous advantage by always attacking, rapidly, ruthlessly, viciously, without rest. Keep punching. God is with us. We shall win. Attack, attack, and when in doubt, attack again. Patton's major principle for fighting battles or a war. His chief mission, he believed, was to arouse the morale of his men. He urged them on, certain that speed and boldness could shorten the war. Like Monty, he believed in showmanship. But he was aware that if the act could not be carried off in fine style, the men would see through it. Both leaders used every means to inspire the troops of their vast command. Sicily proved to be a model campaign. Sound tactics and a fighting spirit won the island in 38 days. Then, his whereabouts carefully concealed from the German high command, he appeared in Great Britain. New troops heard him in an introductory speech and called him Old Blood and Guts. The old timers referred to him as the old man, who knew more about fighting than any man alive. He called a spade a spade. He told them to get mad and stay mad. They listened. On D-Day, behind Bradley's first army, another army assembled, Patton's third. With plenty of armor, this outfit was like its commander. Fast, hard-hitting, spirited, spectacular. Peninsula began a rolling advance, an all-out smashing attack, the Patton version of a German blitzkrieg. The old man had said, the harder we push, the more Nazis we'll kill. And the more Nazis we kill, the fewer of our men will be killed. Pushing means fewer casualties. The third took the old man at his word and found he was right. St. Malo, the beginning of a long list of towns, occupied by Germans one day, liberated the next. At the head of a vast crusading army, a man fulfilling a destiny he had dreamed of since early youth. The attacks now were in all directions at once, toward the south and north and east toward Germany. The 
III advanced like a tidal wave. And the enemy's response was fear. He told his men, in the last two weeks, the third has advanced farther and faster than any other army in history. My intention is to move farther and faster still. Outrunning its maps, the third army crossed the Seine. In his words, he was touring France with an army. He was everywhere at once, covering the great distances within his command. His use of light aircraft exemplified his eagerness to adopt any new means of increasing efficiency. Throughout, the 19th Tactical Air Command of the 8th Army Air Force gave incredibly close support. Astounding advances went on and on. Patton saw nothing in the way. He was ready to push on into the heart of Germany. Struggling to keep up with his fast moving front was a miraculous supply effort known as the Red Ball Express. But now Patton's supply lines were strained to the utmost. Winter was approaching. Other Allied armies were feeling the pinch. The third was ordered to hold up, to take the defensive. Nothing but defeat itself could have made the general more depressed. This was a difficult time for an army built to roll. The tension for Patton was finally eased. He was assured by his old friend that the third would eventually receive adequate supplies to resume what they had begun. Patton urged his leaders to keep high the morale created during the offensive. He himself delivered the pep talks for which he was famous, giving credit, instilling pride, urging men to even greater deeds. Then, the green light. In 400 years, this fortress city had withstood every assault. was no cheap victory. But the fall of this highly regarded fortification bore out Patton's belief that no defense position had ever been successfully defended. The trail of the Third Army and the 19th Tactical Air Command and the 8th Air Force is marked by more than 40,000 white crosses, 40,000 dead Americans. The famous third was now on the loose again, on a spring rampage that would bring the war to a close before summer. Again, Patton's army was going beyond expectations. The 
The enemy believed Patton would pause at the Rhine. He went right across. Now, along a wide front, his divisions fought toward the final goal. Always, he took time out to give credit where it really belonged, to the men, to Private Harold A. Garman, the Medal of Honor. Exalting sacrifice, Patton never dwelt long on the horrors of war. But as his Third Army overran concentration camps in Germany, he saw horror of a new kind. piled up as the third turned southwest to link up with Soviet forces in the Danube Valley. It was over. For a moment, Patton relaxed his carefully maintained role of colorful leader to be himself. On his return, Americans showed their gratitude. In General Pershing's words, it didn't hurt America to have a general so bold that he was dangerous. Los Angeles went all out in its reception. With him was General Doolittle, whose eighth air force in Europe did so much to assure final victory. Although no unit, no individual won the war, we're fortunate in having one here tonight with us who had a large part in winning the war. I'm pleased and proud to have been privileged to fight by the side of General George Patton. Your Honor, the Mayor, General Doolittle, soldiers, ladies and gentlemen, coming over here, there was a very great lesson. The first four hours, we passed over a destroyed land, utterly destroyed. You who have not seen it do not know what hell looks like from the top. That's what Germany looks like. That's what Austria looks like. That's what any place that the 8th Air Force and the 3rd Army worked on looks like. You must remember this, that from Brest to various towns in southern Germany and Austria, whose names I can't pronounce, but who, whose places I have removed, The trail of the 3rd Army and the 19th Tactical Air Command and the 8th Air Force is marked by more than 40,000 white crosses, 40,000 dead Americans. Few realized how deeply he felt about his men. Germany, with no more battles to win, Patton watched Americans compete on the playing field. Again, he saw the fighting spirit, the will to win, a quality he loved and admired, and which epitomized himself. Struggle was the test of a man, 
war, the supreme struggle provided the highest test. He had expected his own death to be spectacular. In this one prediction, he was more mistaken than in the planning of any battle. He died of injuries received in an automobile accident four months after the end of the war. place of burial among the men of the Third Army who had fallen in the Battle of the Bulge. His personality lives on in his statue at West Point. He lived for action and glory and reached the heights in serving his country. In 1909, a frail contraption was flown across the English Channel by Louis Blerio. What this little plane could do impressed a young American who began to wonder even then about the military effects of not one, but many flying machines in the air at the same time. That young lieutenant was Henry Hap Arnold. He was to become the commanding general of the greatest air force in history. Two and a half million men and 70,000 aircraft. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Walter Matthau. This is the story of a man and his dream. A dream that he pursued with clear vision and single-minded devotion through most of the years of his life. General Henry Harley Arnold, or Hap Arnold as he was known to all the world was the personification of the United States Air Force. He attended its birth. He grew up with it, and he commanded it in its most glorious hour. The gigantic weapon that he created proved one of the key factors in the Allied victory that was won in World War II. But to his countrymen, Hap Arnold was more than a successful military figure. He was a man of great personal warmth of uncompromising integrity and never failing kindness. It is with pride and gratitude that we salute a great American, General Henry Harley Hap Arnold. military potentialities, suddenly we were in desperate need of trained flyers.
1911, when getting a heavier-than-air machine aloft was still something of a miracle, Second Lieutenant Hap Arnold was engaged in a project having nothing at all to do with flight and everything to do with launching his military career. He was trying very hard to become a first lieutenant. Meanwhile, the discovery of the Wright brothers was becoming increasingly interesting to the United States Army. The spirit of the Wright brothers, that a practical answer could be found to almost any problem, was to be an inspiration to Hap throughout his life. The Wrights made it seem that anything was possible, creating an enthusiasm among young aeronauts that was sometimes carried to extremes. When Hap volunteered to learn to fly, his CO said, I know of no better way for a person to commit suicide. Skeptical as many were, the Signal Corps had made concrete plans to obtain the necessary planes for a course of instruction. In school at the Wright Brothers Field at Dayton, Hap labeled all the parts. Long ago, before nomenclature became complicated, this was the way it was. From Dayton, Ohio, to the Chief Signal Officer, Sir, I have the honor to report the following progress made by me in learning to operate a Wright airplane. During the week, I've made 12 flights with an instructor and one flight by myself. My instruction, under the personal supervision of the instructor in the machine, is finished. And from now on, all my flights will be made alone for experience. Very respectfully, Henry H. Arnold, 2nd Lieutenant, 24th Infantry. Hap was one of the first qualified pilots in the United States Army. In later years, he never lost the glow of pride and the respect for this symbol of achievement. Hap was the first to win the McKay Trophy for air reconnaissance. And in 1912, he set a high altitude record of 6,450 feet. In the earliest days of airmail service, he was one of our first couriers. All this experience in the embryo aviation division of the Signal Corps helped him to train others to fly and put him in the front line of those gaining important knowledge about military aviation. Not only better planes and more thorough pilot training, but more men for servicing planes. These were problems which Hap seemed to grasp with a quick understanding. When World War I came, the nation was still only barely aware of aviation's military potentialities. Suddenly, we were in desperate need of trained flyers. From the ranks of the infantry and from all services, men were carefully selected for the aviation section of the Signal Corps. Even more important was our need for aircraft. Administrative problems, including aircraft production, became HAP's responsibility. On the home front, Hap began to learn some lessons that were to have great meaning when he was in command of the Air Force many years later. To produce aircraft for war, one must plan and build long before. Many were the planes and engines finished too late for combat. Hap firmly resolved that America would not be caught short again. With the war over, the nation relaxed. But for Hap and other American airmen, this was the beginning of a battle to convince Americans of the importance of air power. Using some old German battleships as targets, Billy Mitchell showed what precision bombing could do. In the post-war years, Hap was in the forefront of those trying to keep the spark of interest in aviation alive. Sun flying seemed one of the ways. To average Americans, this was worth watching. Meanwhile, there were real steps ahead important to aviation's future. Safer parachutes, for example. Observation from the air became a means of keeping forest fires under control. 
In the winter of 1932, under Hap's command, there were airdrops of food to the snowbound Indians of the Southwest. This, one of the earliest airlifts, was a prelude to that in Berlin 16 years later. There were also experiments in the field of photo reconnaissance. There was help in the development of new bombers. In these years, Hap was carrying forth the program of building the Air Corps. He was deeply convinced of its military importance. Helping to build the Air Corps didn't interfere with building a lively family. These old home movies show time passing in the Arnold family and pleasantly. They reveal, as do all pictures of Hap, the reason for his nickname picked up in the days of West Point. The family reflects the dad's good humor, and the dad, growing older and wiser, still exudes the quality for which millions will soon know him. No moniker ever stuck more firmly to a man than to Hap. 1934, the B-10, a new all-metal plane carrying a 2,000-pound bomb load, then the fastest bomber in the world. Under Hap's command, a long-range test flight from Washington, D.C. to Fairbanks, Alaska was undertaken to determine the feasibility of air operations in this part of the globe. Under extreme Arctic conditions, the mission, unusual for its time, was carried out successfully. On his return, Hap was honored with the Mackay Trophy a second time. 1938, on the day before Hitler won a victory at Munich, Major General Hap Arnold was appointed Chief of the U.S. Army Air Corps. Advise our nation to arm for air defense immediately. A strong air force is absolutely essential to keep war out of America. From the beginning, the Commander-in-Chief found in Hap someone he could rely on. He respected Hap's judgment. Together, they saw that time to build and expand had now become precious. Hap's plans went ahead. Planes for ground support, fighter bombers, long-range bombers, fast interceptors, an air force that was both tactical and strategic. Remembering the First World War, Hap pressed for the quantity production of aircraft that would be necessary for a global conflict for a war of far greater proportions than the world had ever known. Each day was important now for building planes, for training men, pilots, navigators, bombardiers, gunners, and ground crews. The race against time was on. In these months, Hap worked tirelessly to mold the Army Air Corps into a fully prepared fighting service. Achievement came in spite of opposition from those who, even at this late date, felt that we were well protected by oceans on either side. Pearl Harbor brought into critical focus the need for huge quantities of aircraft and vast numbers of men to fly and maintain them. Well aware of the time and money involved, Hap had been steadily extending the Army Air Corps training program, coordinating this with our growing air strength. Since 1939, he had fostered the idea of having civilian schools help to train pilots in the first stage. Army Air Corps training had been systematized, and it would include many young men from all walks of life. Not all were needed as pilots, or for that matter, were meant to be pilots. Though some took to the air unsteadily, 
the huge quotas of trained pilots, mechanics, and other personnel were soon being met. Pat Arnold, a man at a desk with a huge task, requiring long-range planning and careful utilization of our limited air strength on a worldwide battlefield. Early in the war, isolated operations began to foreshadow the future effect of long-range bombing. The daring low-level raid on Tokyo was a carefully designed attack which brought home to Japan the real meaning of war. The leader of this successful mission, Jimmy Doolittle, was welcomed home by a much gratified chief. Hap always took great pride in the achievement of his men, and they were made aware of his personal interest. In the following months of battle against the Luftwaffe, American pilots demonstrated a kind of bravery that did credit to the Army Air Corps and that heartened the nation. Whenever the opportunity afforded, there were frequent visits to his men. Always Hap was received with enthusiasm and affection. No commander was better liked, more deeply respected. As Hap went about the vast problem of building American air power, of deciding what types of planes for what specific purposes, a concept began to form in his mind. Perhaps this concept went back to the day when he first saw the plane in which a Frenchman had flown across the channel. That day when he thought, if one plane, why not many in the air at the same time? Now he saw the huge strength possible in mass formations of long-range bombers, each a fortress in the air, a multitude of flying fortresses in continued strategic bombing of the enemy, meanwhile destruction of the enemy air force in combat, air supremacy. This was his goal. This was the biggest task of his life. With production chief Bill Knudsen, he toured plants and factories. As time went on, as people came to know who Hap was and the job he was doing, his reputation grew. Deadly serious, but always human. This was the way Hap did business. Thank you, Dr. Lewis. You know, doctor, after looking over my audience, I'm gonna give my prepared speech back to Captain Sheffield. <laughs> And if you want it for your record, you can ask Captain Sheffield for it. And I'm sure, I'm sure that he'll be glad to give it to you. Now on with the show. <laughs> I think that you people here are entitled to a little bit of background on this thing that we call air power. Air power. No one was better suited to talk about it than Hap, or better able to put words into action to mold our Air Force into the strongest in the world. Hap's keen awareness of the significance of air power made him invaluable on the international scene. At many conferences, including Casablanca, Hap was able to work smoothly and effectively with our allies. But here, and for months to come, Hap was to argue for an idea that was not particularly acceptable, mass bombing of the enemy during daylight hours. The plan was not greeted with favor, for at this time the British were successfully carrying out a program of night bombing. While night bombing by the RAF was proving effective, it was Hap's argument that daylight precision bombing could cause far greater devastation than was possible during darkness.
it knocked out Germany, could do the same in Japan. The B-29, the pioneer of air intercontinental bombers. The plane which, thanks to Hap's convictions and leadership, had been in the works long enough to be ready. In the Far East, there were other problems. Hap went over the air needs of this theater with General Joseph Stilwell and General Chenault. Here it was decided that a difficult flying route over the Himalayas could provide a flow of supplies to the Chinese. The airlift over the hump was one of the extraordinary accomplishments of the war. Hap, as commanding general U.S. Army Air Forces, was a member of the Allied staff, which met to determine the future course of the war. Here at the Cairo Conference and at Quebec, Hap became known for his judgment and common sense. Among leaders of other nations, Hap was not only the good-natured man with the encyclopedic knowledge of planes and all matters concerning air power, he was a first-rate diplomat upon whom our military staff could depend. By this time, there was complete acceptance of Hap's daylight bombing program by the Allied Command. Hap had won a personal victory in a difficult realm. Pilots had been needed in large number early in the war, and with Hap's encouragement, a women's branch of the Air Force was organized. The Women's Air Force Service Pilots, known as the WASPs, did a tremendous job during the war, freeing many Air Force pilots for combat duty. At the first graduation ceremony, Hap was the honored guest. August 2nd, 1943, the 9th Air Force carried out the hazardous low-level raid on a strategic target, the Ploeste oil fields in Romania. 177 B-24 Liberators from the Tripoli area seriously damaged these important oil-producing fields. By 1944, the program for massive high-altitude air bombardments began to reach its peak. Now, at last, thousands of strategic bombers with new long-range fighter escorts were over Germany at the same time. And now the question was, could this tremendous all-out effort be continued? There was no let-up. There had been thorough planning in every detail that had placed the thousands of planes over Germany at the same time. No one was more instrumental in achieving our long-range plan for strategic bombing of the enemy than Hap Arnold. Through his effort, nothing had been allowed to stand in the way of the plan to use air power to knock Germany out of the war. At the end, we were unmolested in the skies, total air supremacy. At the close of the war in Germany, at the conference in Potsdam, Hap participated in plans for the unfinished work in the Pacific. And after this conference, Hap, with the glow of victory still upon him, recognized the contributions of all the services in the defeat of Germany. This is an appropriate occasion, for we are celebrating tonight the 38th birthday of military air power in the United States. At this time, the newest of the service, services acknowledge the debt it owes to the armies of our land and the navies of our sea. We dip our wings to their glorious traditions, and tonight particularly, I want also to salute all of those who fly and those who make flying possible, be they of the Marines or of the Navy, or in civilian aviation in any of its many forms, or in the Army Air Forces. 
for they have all played a part in winning this war. Now able to concentrate full attention on the war with Japan, he flew to bases in the Pacific. Friendly and good-natured, he found what he wished to know without seeming to try. Receptive, even-tempered, he was on the best terms with his commanders, extremely sensitive to their problems. Now, according to plan, what had knocked out Germany could do the same in Japan. The B-29, the pioneer of air intercontinental bombers. The plane which, thanks to Hap's convictions and leadership, had been in the works long enough to be ready. Three months after VJ Day, General of the Army Hap Arnold terminated 42 years of service. Hap lived to see his greatest dream come true. On September 18, 1947, the creation of a separate service, the United States Air Force. Five years after retirement, his full life came to a close. He was buried at Arlington Cemetery in January 1950. Hosts of devoted friends mourned his passing. Throughout the nation, there was a sense of deep personal loss. There is much to remind us of his role in American air power. This is the Arnold Engineering Development Center at Tullahoma, Tennessee. Not only in name, but in spirit, was General Arnold identified with this center, devoted to research and development in the Air Force, to problems of air and space engineering. Since his time, much has happened, and in many ways, what he stood for has come to pass. It was Hap Arnold who sought the best in aircraft and material, continuous experimentation, development, progress in the air. He was foremost in urging a separate air force for defending America in the skies. It was he who urged a strategic air command, our global atomic striking force, a massive deterrent to the threat of war. It was he who advocated an air force second to none as a means not only of defense, but of preventing another global catastrophe. He saw the need for greater public interest in matters of air power. Without awareness and support, no nation could expect to remain strong. As the years go by, as we move faster and faster in and into the age of space, one influence above all seems now more lasting. It was General Arnold who envisioned an institution to train Air Force leaders, capable of guiding our nation's air defense, whatever the future. The Air Force Academy, and every man who is honored to attend there, is profoundly touched by his influence. Here there is thoroughness and dedication to the task. The standards at the Academy stem in large measure from the example set by the first Air Force leader, who in June 1949 was made the first General of the Air Force. From this academy that was once his vision will come other leaders with the training, background and spirit, and with their own vision of what must be done.
Such men will help keep America free, as did Hap Arnold. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Walter Matthau. Omar Nelson Bradley, one of our very great soldiers, has been described as a quiet gentleman who might pass for a professor. But there is an unmistakable quality of greatness in his simple manner, his straightforwardness, and his deep concern for humanity. Recognized as a master strategist, he was given command of the forces that spearheaded and carried through to victory the campaigns and the invasion of Hitler's Europe. While the headlines and popular applause fell to others, it was Bradley, the quiet infantryman in his old trench coat, trudging through the scarred battlefields who held the fate of his soldiers in his hands. When it was over, a grateful chief of staff saluted him with this simple statement, all our confidence in you has been justified. It is with great pride that we present the story of General Omar Nelson Bradley. Fifty miles from the Missouri River on the birthday of Abraham Lincoln, Omar Bradley was born into the home of a poorly paid country school teacher. The year was 1893. In countries such as this, he learned to fish, hunt quail, became an expert marksman. He was the only child. The name Omar came from a family friend, not the Persian poet. Bradley idolized his father, acquiring from him a way of life. To patch up the family budget, the elder Bradley did some farming. From such roots, the boy learned the meaning of patience, the patience that comes with fishing. Bradley was only 14 when his father died. After high school, what? It was hard to say. He sold newspapers worked at the Wabash Railroad shops at 17 cents an hour. But a Sunday school teacher suggested West Point. And West Point it became, the United States Military Academy. Here had studied Lee, Grant, Pershing. The class of 1915, Brad's class, was to furnish 56 generals. One could say of Bradley, as quiet as the Hudson a trait that was duly noted by his class biographer. True merit is like a river. The deeper it is, the less noise it makes. This was Bradley. And they wrote further of him. His most prominent characteristic is getting there. Just how much prophecy was in this remark? Let us see. In World War I, he commanded an infantry company at the Butte, Montana copper mines. His own evaluation, ruin. He was left out of the fight. 1920, ordered to West Point as an instructor in mathematics. From 1924 to 1939, Army schools, routine duty periods with troops in the United States and Hawaii, then on to general staff in Washington. Finally, in the early part of 1941, Commandant of the Infantry School at Fort Benning, Georgia. Was he getting there? 
Well, he was acquiring the reputation of a fine infantry officer. There wasn't a thing these men did that Bradley couldn't or wouldn't do, for he had great physical endurance. February 1943. Bradley was in Florida training a division for duty overseas. World War II was in its second year for the United States, and Bradley was to be included in the fight. Word finally came to report to French North Africa. The Battle of Europe was to be a doughboy's battle, and beating these doughboys was a man who, in the words of General Marshall, was fit for any command in the army. For the first time in 32 years as a soldier, Bradley was off to war. Selected by Chief of Staff General George C. Marshall, who had been watching this great infantryman for years. Now as deputy commander and commander of the U.S. Second Corps, he helped push the Tunisian campaign to victory. British Commander General Sir Alexander says, well done. Bradley tells all about it in his book, A Soldier's Story. Was he getting there? As they would say out in Bradley's country, he fought to beat the band. After Africa, the invasion of Sicily. Bradley took 2nd Corps into Sicily under General George S. Patton's command. Plans for the Channel assault on France were well underway when General Marshall sent word to Eisenhower, my choice has been Bradley. He meant for Bradley to lead the American forces for the great Normandy invasion, Operation Overlord. As commanding general of the First Army, Bradley was ashore less than 24 hours after the first Allied units hit the Normandy beaches. The Battle of Europe was to be a doughboy's battle, and leading these doughboys was a man who, in the words of General Marshall, was fit for any command in the army. A week after D-Day, and we had linked the Allied forces together in a beachhead 42 miles wide. A prime objective, the port of Cherbourg. As Bradley's first army pushed ahead, happy Frenchmen began to breathe the first fresh air of liberation, and we began to feel at home. to crack those Nazis. At all costs, they meant to keep us from getting a harbor, a suitable port for our supplies. Nazi commanders now felt the power of Bradley's punch. For once Bradley made up his mind, he moved swiftly, relentlessly. Was he getting there? 
Following the Battle of San Lo, he headed the 12th Army Group. As American forces plowed ahead, they moved out of the peninsula, then toward and beyond Paris. 43 divisions were to be deployed under Bradley's command. The 12th Army Group included General Courtney H. Hodges, 1st Army, General George S. Patton, Jr.'s 3rd Army, General William H. Simpson's 9th Army, and General Leonard T. Giroux's 15th Army. No sit-back at headquarters type of general, Bradley inspected a battle in person, traveling in an ordinary jeep. There wasn't a bit of glamour or fanfare in his whole tall, lanky frame. He got the most out of his men by patient goodwill. He knew every division commander by his first name. When an officer performed as he expected him to, he gave him a free hand. When he hesitated, he tried to help him. And when he failed, Bradley relieved him and all respected him. Even Patton, Bradley's chief in French North Africa and Sicily. In fact, George S. Patton became one of his closest friends. did Bradley think of the boss and vice versa? There was a mutual trust. Stout-hearted and confident of result was the way the chief described Bradley. Many battles justified faith in Bradley, but one especially was the big breakout. The battle for San Lo and the breakthrough from the peninsula one of the most decisive battles of Bradley's military career. The breakthrough cracked the back of the Nazi Wehrmacht. Bradley had created it, planned it down to the last detail. Uprooting meant taking quicker and firmer root in freedom's soil. Out came our armies. The way was open. The way to Paris. The enemy west of Paris was destroyed. As he fell, the liberation of France lay only days away. That the Bradley breakthrough worked was due to a soldier's determination. Our hopes now ran high for a quick end to the war in Europe. Bradley could have gone into Paris himself, but the quiet man from Missouri was not built like that. He had waited for his chief. A liberated nation honored him. Bradley was to receive many decorations, 
as well as honorary degrees from universities. Someone has said of Bradley that he always behaves as though he were a civilian among men in uniform. Even as Paris celebrated, something was happening. After the fastest blitz of modern war, we had to apply the brakes. Logistics, that age-old problem of supplying a mighty fighting force on the offensive, had run into difficulties. We had lost momentum. The deep stalemate of winter set in. Quite suddenly, counterattack, the Battle of the Bulge, the greatest crisis in Bradley's military career. Dark moments, unpredictable moments. It was the enemy's dying thrust. We were thrown back. Even when the enemy was a few miles from his headquarters, Bradley refused to move back. He reasoned such a move could destroy confidence. Your identification, General. From stars down, solid proof was needed these trying days that you were not a Nazi disguised as an American. The Battle of the Bulge over, the Rhine soon came into view. There wasn't much more to it after this. Operation Overlord, which had swept a relatively unknown general into great prominence, had blasted asunder the myth of Nazi invulnerability. From the Omaha beachhead to Berlin, a stunned enemy wondered how it could have happened. Farm boy to four stars. Was he getting there? True to American tradition, the job helped make the man. And the man made history and he never once lost his humility. Was there room for a fifth star? As chairman of the Joint Chiefs, America's top soldier took his seat at the first meeting of the Defense Committee of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization held in Washington. With a soldier's determination, but no, with the determination of a man enjoying the softer moments of peace. Bradley, a top-notch golfer, scores high on the fairway. But a hop, skip, and a jump from the fairway was busy Washington. And in post-war America, Bradley played a big role in world affairs. Affairs as they pertain to our survival as a nation. We see him here in the fall of 1948 as Army Chief of Staff. Prior to becoming the Army's Chief, he had spent two years as Veterans Administrator. With him are Air Chief Hoyt Vandenberg and Navy Chief Louis E. Denfeld. In Bradley's characteristic way, he considered his job another opportunity to serve his country. And America needed him. For a new type of world jitters had set in. The Cold War, modeled by the Kremlin. For example, the Great Airlift of 1948 and 1949. Starved the people of West Berlin came orders from Moscow. So the Red Army imposed a blockade on all overland transport between Berlin and the West. All trade stopped. In 
industrial paralysis threatened West Berlin. But not for long. The air was still free, and from the free nations poured fabulous supplies for the people of West Berlin. the blockade, our first victory in the Cold War. This type of war called for a reassessment of our military objectives. And that's where Bradley fit into the picture. He became a globetrotter, a sort of soldier diplomat. Here we see him arriving in Germany. His mission, to discuss plans for collective security with member nations of the North Atlantic Alliance. This was to be insurance against aggression by Soviet Russia. Bradley, the world headliner. The story of Omar Bradley would not be complete without mentioning the former Mary Elizabeth Quayle, who married Bradley a year after his graduation from West Point. Here she watches Bradley being sworn in as chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff by Defense Secretary Johnson. With great pride, Mrs. Bradley will tell you that Omar is a considerate husband and father. As chairman of the Joint Chiefs, America's top soldier took his seat at the first meeting of the Defense Committee of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization held in Washington. Resist aggression. That was the keynote. Yes, there was room for a fifth star by act of Congress and the deep respect and admiration of a fellow Missourian. A little trouble with the pin, but both Bradley and the president made it. to frequent visitor at the White House. This is early in 1951 at a Security Council meeting. He sits beside the man who, along with his father, signalized his ideals in life. General Marshall, at this time Secretary of Defense. And again at the White House, with ministers of defense and military advisors of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Bradley paid almost 300 visits to the White House, many of them to brief the president on the progress of the war in Korea. Again, he visited war rooms, this time under the banner of the United Nations. As a global military strategist, Bradley believed that we should not press our military advantage too far in this one area of communist aggression. Fighting raged from June 1950 to July 1953. These were precarious times. At stake was our global prestige, our voice in the free world. War by satellite was a new type of Soviet aggression, where the Kremlin directed a conflict in the front yard of Korean homes. As in World War II, Bradley helped direct Allied forces close to the battle lines. And so it came to pass, from the year 1915, a West Point classmate of Bradley's, Ike by name, went places too, becoming president of the United States. He is playing host here to our top soldier of the nation and other members of the class of 15. Time, May 1953. 
shortly before Bradley's leaving active assignments. It seemed fitting at this time to name an American town after Bradley. To quote Bradley, no boy ever came out of an army camp with any more or any less moral fiber and any more or less courage than he had when he left his family fireside. Bradley, West Virginia, on US Route 21, between Beckley and Mount Hope. Did he get there? Well, seems like there's more to do. Mission, to help in military reorganization. He has come a long way, this general from the humble roots of America, to enrich our heritage of service to mankind and love of country. A living monument among the truly great men of history. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Walter Matthau. A nation's greatness depends on the quality of the leaders it produces in times of crisis. We Americans have been very fortunate in this respect, particularly in regard to the military commanders who led our armies in times of national peril. Their record of success is unparalleled in the history of the world. Who are these men? Do we really know them? Do we know how they lived, what they thought? Do we know what special qualities of heart and mind they possessed which qualified them to have the destiny of a nation placed in their hands? The big picture has prepared a series of pictorial biographies of some of the great military leaders of American history. High on any soldier's roll call of honor is the name of General John Joseph Pershing, or as he was called with admiration and respect, Black Jack Pershing. In a remarkable career that began in the half-remembered time of the last century and ended with the dropping of the first atomic bomb, Pershing gave himself devotedly to the service of his country. He left a legacy of strength, simplicity, and honor that will remain etched in the souls of his countrymen for all time. This is his story. at the age of 25, Pershing was graduated from the military academy. The qualities of leadership about which the world would one day hear a great deal had already begun to show clearly. In his final year, he was elected president of his class and appointed senior captain of cadets. In the 1880s, Rebel Indian tribes in the West were still the greatest threat to American lives and property. And it was the lot of most young professional officers to be pressed into service in these campaigns to make the West secure. Lieutenant Pershing, cavalry, saw his first action the year of his graduation in the fighting in the Southwest, which brought an end to the war against the Apaches, led by the fierce and wily Geronimo. Later, serving as a leader of Indian scouts, he participated in the final campaign against the rampaging Sioux in South Dakota. In the years of peace that followed the Indian Wars, Pershing left the West 
and served as a military instructor at West Point. The period of peace, however, was soon shattered by the war with Spain after the sinking of the battleship Maine. These are actual motion pictures of American ships steaming into Havana Harbor in 1898 and American troops landing in Cuba. This film was only recently released by the laboratories of the inventor of motion pictures, Thomas Edison. One of the units fighting with distinction in the memorable drive on Santiago was the 10th Cavalry, and one of the officers fighting with valor in the 10th Cavalry was John J. Pershing. He was cited for his personal gallantry, and his commanding officer said of him, Pershing is the coolest man under fire I ever saw. When the stars and stripes were raised in victory, Pershing himself later said, it lifted us out of ourselves. It was the soldier's silent Ave Maria. The Spanish-American War abundantly demonstrated Pershing's courage, but it remained for a subsequent event the quelling of insurrectionary forces in the newly acquired Philippine Islands to bring out his qualities as a diplomat. His assignment was to subdue the Moros, a proud and fierce tribe who began to cause trouble after the withdrawal of the Spaniards following the Spanish-American War. Pershing, now a captain, not only subdued them, he won their friendship as well an exhibition of military and diplomatic skill that attracted the attention of the authorities in Washington. President Theodore Roosevelt personally applauded Pershing's accomplishments. And in 1905, while Pershing was serving as U.S. observer of the war between Japan and Russia, Roosevelt promoted him from captain to brigadier general, over 862 officers who were senior to him. In 1915, Pershing was in command of the Southwestern Division along the Mexican border, defending American interests against increasingly frequent raids by bandits across the border. It was at this time that the great personal tragedy of his life occurred. His wife and three daughters were lost in a fire which raked the Presidio at San Francisco, where they were living in his absence. Only his son was saved. Characteristically, Pershing bore his loss with silent fortitude and turned his wholehearted effort to the new duty to which his country called him. Command of the punitive expedition into Mexico in pursuit of Pancho Villa, the most bold and reckless of all the Mexican bandits who had destroyed American lives and property in a brutal raid on Columbus, New Mexico. Daringly and courageously for nearly a year, Pershing led his troops over 400 miles of trackless desert under the most trying and hampering of conditions. When the expedition was withdrawn, bandit harassment had been greatly reduced. And the American people, whose heroes must be made of enduring stuff, had found in John J. Pershing a unique study in dedication to duty and unflinching loyalty. The American cavalry's firefights in the Chihuahua Desert in Mexico were only a small part of the conflagration that was searing the world. German aggression had reduced great parts of Europe to rubble and uprooted great masses of Europe's population. When German lawlessness on the high seas began to add American lives to the casualty lists, it was obvious that the United States could not avoid participation in the great conflict which had become known with grim appropriateness as the World War. We enter this war, said President Woodrow Wilson in his address before Congress, only because there is no other way of defending our rights. The professional army was small and the only hope lay in a great citizen army, which had to be raised up literally overnight. When Pershing was named to head the American expeditionary force that would go to France, the nation applauded. For the first time in history, American soldiers would fight in the glare of world attention, with the entire world having a direct stake in the outcome of their effort. The commander-in-chief, now a major general, arrived in Europe in June ahead of his troops. 
Shortly thereafter, he was promoted to full general, a rank only four Americans, Washington, Grant, Sherman, and Sheridan, had held before him. A spirit moved across America in those memorable months of 1917, uniting the people as they had never been united before, touching their effort with a faith and a patriotic fervor which still live in the music that animated the nation's soul. and specially trained troops hit the Allied line. And in a succession of drives, they shattered the British front and broke through Allied defenses. The Allies counterattacked, and for the first time since 1914, the Western Front was aflame with open warfare. Pershing firmly believed that three qualities were necessary for Allied victory. An offensive spirit, mobility on the battlefield, and effective use of individual weapons. He trained his growing army in these principles, despite the elaborate system of trench defense in which the Western Front had been paralyzed. One of his greatest conflicts came with the Allies themselves, who wanted to use the new American troops as replacements in their own divisions. But Pershing held out for an integral American army, which would fight under its own flag and its own commanders. The prestige of the nation itself would stand or fall on the performance of that army in the test of battle. That test came with a massive German offensive which began in the spring of 1918. For almost four years, the battle line had held relatively steady. But now the Germans counted on victory. Their plan was to separate the British armies from the French in a devastating series of blows. Thousands of tough and specially trained troops hit the Allied line. And in a succession of drives, they shattered the British front and broke through Allied defenses. The Allies counterattacked, and for the first time since 1914, the Western Front was aflame with open warfare.
In the crisis, Pershing postponed his plan to weld an American army, and he offered Marshal Foch, commander-in-chief of the Allied armies in France, the free use of every American man and gun. When the Germans cut through the Allied lines in a thrust to the Somme River, the world had its first substantial chance to see the Yanks in action at Cantigny. Pershing threw the first division in to help stop the German drive here. of the 1st Division took Cantigny and held it, despite violent and sustained counterattacks. In another breakthrough, the Germans rolled across the defenses on the Aisne River, stretching from Soissons to Reims, in a driving relentless force which struck panic into the French nation. In three days, the German tide had reached the Marne River and was less than 40 miles from Paris. Pershing moved the 2nd and 3rd U.S. divisions into the area around Chateau Thierry to help stem this onslaught. Both divisions responded with spectacular spirit and success. The 3rd Division, in its battle for the Marne crossings, wrote one of the most brilliant pages of our military annals, said General Pershing. One of its regiments, the 38th Infantry, earned the proud designation Rock of the Marne. The 2nd Division, holding the road between Chateau Thierry and Paris, began pushing the Germans back. U.S. Marines, fighting with the 2nd Division, reclaimed important ground in a fierce contest known to history now as the Battle of Bellow Wood. The Allies pressed the counterattack forward, and by the end of July, the entire Marne salient was removed. The tide had now turned. The initiative had passed to Allied hands, where it would remain. Eight U.S. divisions had participated in the successful counteroffensive, and their performance had met their commander's expectations and exceeded all others. Bravo, the young Americans, a British newspaper trumpeted and a French dispatch reported that their victories had electrified the world. The doughboy had proved his ability as a fighter, and it was obvious to all that the constantly increasing American forces were to be the decisive factor in the war. Marshal Foch decided the time was ripe for one great coordinated Allied offensive. The AEF's first assignment was to be the reduction of the saint Miel salient a projection 16 miles into the Allied line below Verdun, which the Germans had held for four years and which hampered lateral communications along the battlefront. The saint Miel offensive, which began on September 12th, was the first operation in the war carried out by a complete American army under the separate and independent control of General Pershing. a striking success. In two days, the Yanks took their objectives and the salient was reduced. Now America's soldiers were moving to the beat of the muffled drums of history. Because they had fought so decisively as an integrated American force, they were moving in the long tradition of their country, a tradition stretching back across the flats of Yorktown through the rolling fields of Gettysburg, up the rugged slopes of San Juan Hill. The man who had welded them into this integrated force had by now made his own unique mark on the history of his times. As a tactician, seeking victory through fire and movement on a fluid battlefield, Pershing was proving himself superb. To the men of the AEF, who knew him best by the nickname Blackjack, he was no myth. The battle was his as well as theirs. He had confidence in them, and they gave him their trust and respect. The final action for the Americans was an assault against the German lines, 
on a broad front extending from the Meuse River to the Argonne Forest. Americans made a field of glory of their battleground that violent autumn in the province of Lorraine, and in the hearts of their countrymen, a strong pride moved like wind across the water. But now there was also a deep and gripping awareness of the cost of victory. And in the cadence of the America of that dim and distant time, along with the crash of cannon, echoes also the haunting poetry written by one of her soldier sons with a timelessness that made it an enduring part of the literature of the age. It may be death shall take my hand and close my eyes and quench my breath. It may be I shall pass him still. I have a rendezvous with death on some scarred slope of battered hill. The Meuse Argonne offensive involved the most severe fighting that an American army had ever been called upon to wage in all the nation's history to that time. But doggedly, steadily, never once retreating, the Yanks pushed forward through the fire-swept fields of no man's land into the very teeth of the enemy's defenses along the invincible Hindenburg line. Your achievement, General Pershing told them when it was all over, is scarcely to be equaled in America's history. At 11 o'clock in the morning, November 11, 1918, the soldiers laid down their guns and cheered. When the body of the unknown soldier was returned from France for burial, Pershing led the nation in its tribute. At 11 o'clock in the morning, November 11, 1918, the soldiers laid down their guns and cheered. And their cheers were echoed in every city of the Allied world. I pay supreme tribute, General Pershing said when the guns had stilled, to our officers and soldiers of the line. When I think of their heroism, I am filled with emotion which I am unable to express. Pershing himself was decorated by nine foreign governments, as well as his own country. He stayed in Europe for a while after the war was ended. He was with President Wilson when the president came over for the Versailles meeting of the Big Four, Clemenceau of France, Lord George of Britain, Orlando of Italy, as well as Wilson of the United States. Then Pershing bade goodbye to his old comrades in arms. He returned home to receive a hero's welcome. A grateful Congress conferred upon him the rank of General of the Armies of the United States. He is the only man in history to have held that rank. He became Chief of Staff of the Army in 1921 and shaped a national defense program. When Marshal Foch visited the United States in the years immediately after the war, Pershing was on hand to greet him. He took delight in showing the Marshal the evidence of solid French-American friendship, which the two commanders had done so much to forge. When the body of the unknown soldier was returned from France for burial, Pershing led the nation in its tribute. Showing the measure of his own respect for the nation's heroes, Pershing wore only the victory medal, which was awarded to every veteran of the World War. Pershing retired from active service in 1924, but he remained active in the life of the nation. As chairman of the American Battle Monuments Commission, he traveled to Europe many times to witness the dedication of memorials to American soldiers.
His interest in his country's defenses remained as keen as it had ever been. He paid particular attention to the development of the country's future military leaders. failing and old age overtaking him, Pershing called soberly upon his fellow citizens to recognize the growing aggression that was threatening the world. When war did come again, Pershing at 81 instantly offered his services. President Roosevelt accepted, saying in words that reflected the feeling of all the people, you are magnificent. Throughout World War II, he gave the benefit of his military wisdom to those who led America to victory in the second and greatest world war. When Pershing died in 1948, at the age of 87, the nation mourned the passing of this leader who was a symbol as well as a man. Men slipping into middle age and beyond it felt the stir of memory. The trenches which separated the years of their youth from the years that came after. The big parade into history in which they had marched in close ranks behind the commander. And young men who had fought their war a generation later who had indeed been born after Pershing had given his last command, could feel something of the same sharp pull. For such was the magic of the Pershing name and the strength of the Pershing character that Americans of all ages could feel that their own lives had in some important way been bound up in his. Pershing lies today in honored repose in the fraternity of the nation's heroic dead on the slopes of Arlington National Cemetery. But his name and his memory are part of the enduring tradition that never dies. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Walter Matthau. Joseph W. Stilwell had spent many years in the service of his country and was already an old man when he was called to greatness. His ordeal was both physical and mental, but he carried on where younger and stronger men fell by the wayside. He was a colorful commander, an inspiring leader, and one of our great military statesmen. His basic mission was to keep the Chinese an effective fighting ally in the Second World War. He carried it out with honor and distinction. He was a familiar figure, the bespeckled old man in the World War I campaign hat, marching briskly at the head of his men as they fought their way through the jungles and across the mountains of Burma. Although his bluntness of speech earned him the nickname of Vinegar Joe, to the millions of men who served under him, he was the kindest and most modest man who ever lived. To all of them, he was, and in memory still remains, Uncle Joe. I doubt if we will see his like again. Joseph Stilwell would emerge to play a heroic role.
Joseph W. Stilwell was born in March of 1883, the place Palatka, Florida. His childhood and early youth, however, were to be spent in Yonkers, New York. Even in earliest years, he bore the stamp in appearance and in character of much we consider typically American. There was a love for sports, and in these he excelled. There were also mischievous high spirits, perhaps too high. Discipline was indicated. And so the family decision to send Joseph Stilwell to the military academy at West Point. The year was 1900, and the decision a fortunate one. Few men could know, as we know through hindsight, that young men with qualities of courage and leadership would be needed to serve the nation through ensuing years of crisis. Between the lines of a yellowed class yearbook, we can read hints of those qualities. For the young quarterback, they were already winning a permanent niche among West Point's football immortals. They were destined to serve him on fields broader than the gridiron. Graduation from the academy did not end Joseph Stilwell's association with West Point. The newly commissioned second lieutenant of infantry was to spend 11 of the next 14 years teaching a succession of classes. His field of instruction, foreign languages. The natural aptitude in these subjects was to prove as fortunate for the nation as was the decision to make the military his profession. In the crowded years not spent at the academy, there would be assignment to service schools and tours of duty in the Philippines and at home. Meanwhile, history was setting the stage for the first of our century's major crises, worldwide conflagration. In its flames, untried American leadership would be tested and tempered. Joseph Stilwell would be among those to receive their baptism of fire. Over there, was the patriotic song of the hour. Over there sailed young American manhood to fight in the first international conflict of our history. With the temporary rank of major, Joseph Stilwell disembarked in France during the bleak, disheartening December of 1917. There followed a brief period of service with a British division. Then, with his fluency in French, he became liaison officer with the French 17th Corps. For the young major, there was now action at Verdun, Le Fair, For service in this last engagement, Stilwell, now Assistant Chief of Staff, 4th Army Corps, received the Distinguished Service Medal for military attainments of a high order, read the citation. With the war's end, it was now Colonel Stilwell who went on to serve with the Army of Occupation within Germany. There he remained until July of 1919. By now, the enthusiastic scenes welcoming American troops back to civilian life were past history. Nor for the returned professional soldier would there be any termination of service. In full recognition of his talent for language, Joseph Stilwell's next assignment of duty was to take him to Pekin, there to study and attain fluency in the many Chinese dialects. With him went his wife and their three children. Two more would be born during the years in China. The comfortable Stilwell home came to reflect his growing appreciation of Oriental art. It was to earn him recognition as a connoisseur. To the Chinese people around him, the perceptive Stilwell brought his own humane understanding. Out of it came mutual respect and warm regard. One day in the future, these would help forge military victory. But before that day, there were to be years of service for Joseph Stilwell. Now he must return to the United States. 
Beside him at Fort Benning's infantry training school, fellow future general officers taught and studied. George C. Marshall, Omar Bradley, names that were to become household words in a nation at war. At Fort Leavenworth's command and general staff school, there were additional years of study. Then, once again, it was back to China, this time as military attaché to the United States Embassy in Pekin. Here he remained as the clash of conflicting interests between Japan and the awakening giant China led inevitably to incident and incident to all-out war. The incident was Manchuria. The military machine of the Mikado required no organizing, for the military clique which then held power had long anticipated this day. The overall plan was to decimate China, reduce her province by province. He needed only first-class equipment, first-class leadership. Chiang Kai-shek, the one leader able to preserve Chinese unity, was by now forced to withdraw to the interior city of Chongqing. From here, he sought endlessly to enlist the aid of other nations. There had already occurred the Panay incident, in which an American ship in Chinese waters had been sunk by Japanese bombers. This had crystallized the American sentiment that had long inclined to sympathy for China. Aid had come as young Americans volunteered their services. Acting unofficially as private citizens, one such group, the Flying Tigers, were winning fame as they took impressive toll of Japanese planes. For China's armies engaged in their unequal struggle, arms and equipment were now made available. To cut off these sources of material aid, Japan systematically occupied or blockaded one after another of China's port cities. In effect, she built a wall around China. Deprived of needed supply from without, a weakened China would be vulnerable to the heavy blows of the invading forces. Once shattered, she could be conquered piecemeal. The former American observer was now back home again, serving at California's Presidio. A major general, he commanded the Third Army Corps. step, history was setting the stage for its climactic tragedy. Out of that tragedy, Joseph Stilwell would emerge to play a heroic role. From a country stunned by disaster, General Stilwell was sent to China, there to serve as chief of Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek's allied staff and with a small American staff to take nominal command of China's 5th and 6th armies. The new responsibility brought in his third star. In the absence of clear-cut allied command lines, General Stilwell's first job was to help in the defense of Burma. Burma offered the only route by which material aid could be fed into China. China must be built up, made stronger and stronger, until her allies could join her in going over to the offensive. That would be a far-off day, for her allies were preoccupied with other theaters of war. The Burma, which was to know Stilwell's exploits, had ceased to be a modern Eden of song and romantic fiction. It had become a battlefield. General Stilwell and his Chinese, together with outnumbered British, Free French, and Dutch troops, fought on, but the effort was doomed. The Japanese steamroller pushed on. It had administered humiliating defeats to the Allies in the Pacific and elsewhere in Southeast Asia. 
It had taken over thousands of square miles, together with peoples and resources. Now it rolled across Burma. India's borders lay open to attack. Worst of all, that last vital land route, the Burma Road, lay useless. Once again, the old lesson must be learned. Courage alone is not enough. For the Allies, withdrawal became retreat. Retreat, a nightmare rock. In the ordeal, Joseph Stilwell's full stature revealed itself. Refusing the comforts his age and rank might have claimed, he personally conducted one group of 400 battered troops, Burmese nurses and civilians, to the safety of India. There at New Delhi, he was to utter the now classic admission of defeat and announce his determination to go back and wipe it out. Here was the honesty, the directness, the tough moral fiber that characterized the man. The battered campaign hat and shirt sleeves now became a familiar sight as the job of regrouping and training began. The overworked term soldier, soldier has lost much luster. But Joseph Stilwell, sharing the hardships and dangers of his men, gave the phrase real meaning. His was the unique capacity for commanding respect and obedience while evoking a genuine affection. Canada came heartening news. Allied leadership in conference authorized greater aid and a newly organized Southeast Asia Command. Supreme Commander was to be Admiral Lord Louis Mountbatten, his deputy, Lieutenant General Joseph Stilwell. The increase in material aid was making greater demands upon air transport. Suddenly, the hitherto ignored operation captured the imagination of the outside world. Flying over the hump became a familiar phrase. Behind the phrase lay the reality of every type of plane available, many lacking modern instruments, flying back and forth in unpredictable weather, their route over uncharted and treacherous mountains. The stockpile for this, the stepchild of the war effort, was mounting. The tools of battle were now ready and waiting to help settle an old score. The sideshow war had been remembered. Air power opened the prelude to attack. And to sustain it, fighters and bombers of the newest types arrived in increasing numbers. Soon the prelude to attack was no longer a curtain raiser, but the first stage of fiery assault. China, from all parts of the British Commonwealth, from India and Burma, and from far off Africa. Men of many races, many tongues were on the march, and with General Stilwell's polyglot army, a growing number of American units. Among them were General Merrill's troops, experienced fighters from the Pacific Theater. Merrill's Marauders was to be their popular name as they helped make history. In the two years of preparation, General Stilwell had molded a machine to beat the enemy at his own game, mountain and jungle warfare. Man-made weapons would exact casualties, but losses even heavier were inflicted by malaria, dysentery, hepatitis, and a wide range of tropical diseases. For the men who fought, Enemy metal could hit as hard, sickness could be as crippling as in any other theater. For them, Burma was no sideshow. Supply for the men in their isolated pockets of warfare often had to come by airdrop. In twisting mile-deep canyons and jungle-covered terrain, a miss by a few yards could be as bad as missing by a few hundred miles.
seemingly everywhere was lean, raw-boned Uncle Joe, as he was referred to generally. Bluntness had also earned him the title Vinegar Joe. Doubtless, there were saltier names coined in the ranks. Doubtless, too, Joseph Stilwell chuckled over them in private. The overworked term soldier, soldier has lost much luster. But Joseph Stilwell, sharing the hardships and dangers of his men, gave the phrase real meaning. His was the unique capacity for commanding respect and obedience while evoking a genuine affection. Perhaps no group regarded the general and the man with warmer feelings than did the Chinese troops in his command. It was no secret that General Se, as he was called, had consistently extolled their courage and promoted their welfare, often in the face of adverse opinion from above. Repaying that faith now were unbroken Chinese victories in the field. like the Salween and Irrawaddy rivers were back in the news. But now these were scenes of successes. It was the enemy who yielded as British-led allied forces reclaimed more and more of Burma's soil. North and south it was the same story. An old humiliation was being erased. It was now two years since the retreat from Burma, and the 61-year-old general could see his timetable for victory working out on schedule. In the circumstances, a birthday celebration was a pleasant and well-earned respite. The presence of a son, Colonel Joseph Stilwell, Jr., marked it a family occasion as well. But however welcome, such respites must be few and far between. The forgotten war in both South and North had reached its climax. Each mile of ground lost in northern Burma meant another mile added to the link between India and China. The Lido Road was growing. On the heels of combat troops, often under enemy harassment, came the men who must hack out that road. The land itself fought back. Jungle growth would completely reclaim and obliterate in two weeks' time the work that neither the enemy nor disease nor climate could halt. Against the enemy, there was the rifle always close by. To fight the soil, every weapon from the axe to explosive charge was employed. The work went on. General Joseph Stilwell was almost literally dragging his road behind him. Yet as he pushed on and the enemy grudgingly yielded, the mule trail became a road. In relative safety, engineering could expand the road into a solid truck route. As it neared completion, the derisive phrase, impossible road, was heard less often. Across jungle-covered plateaus it stretched, across rivers untamed since the creation, yet now they had been harnessed and bridged. Across mountain ranges it traveled to narrow the gap between India and China. Then inevitably came the great day, the day when a first convoy could move along its 1,044 mile length. The enemy had been pushed out of northeast Burma and the way lay clear. Considering the difficulties and the hardships that had been borne in shaping its tortuous route, 
There seemed merit in the words of an American colonel who at the outset had said, you don't have to be crazy to do this job, but it helps. Yet the Lido Road was now a reality. The first convoy rolled into Kuming, a token of the supply flow to follow. Honoring the man who had weathered all opposition to build the route, it was renamed the Stillwell Road. Four months later, Allied command could announce victory in Burma. What of the man who had built the road and forged that victory? The tides and cross currents of events had taken him far from what would have been his hour of triumph. Receiving his fourth star, General Stilwell came home to serve as commander of ground forces. Then off to the Pacific for a tour of battle fronts and installations. In the course of those next months, he became commander of the 10th Army. Later, he was to serve as commanding general at Okinawa. But wherever the assignment, the Stillwell story remained unchanged. He was still blunt, unassuming Uncle Joe, the general with no patience for pomposity and pretense. He was still the gaunt, typical American who somehow reminded of the symbolic figure Uncle Sam. More important, he was still the Joseph Stilwell with an understanding of the men in the ranks and a talent for winning their affection. It was, of course, his own feelings being reflected, as warm feelings always are. Summer of 1945 was ending, and so too history's most devastating war. Like another great military leader who had vowed to return to the scenes of earlier defeat and erase its humiliation, General Stilwell would welcome the date September the 2nd. Aboard the battleship Missouri on that day, General of the Army Douglas MacArthur submitted the formal surrender terms to a defeated enemy. An end had come to the agonies of a tortured world. Peace had come in victory and with honor. Once again for General Stilwell, there was assignment to the Presidio, but now as a prelude to well-earned retirement. At nearby Carmel was his family and the home he loved. Here he had planned to pass the rich remaining years that lay ahead. But now, a new enemy struck. This was the enemy within, one who would not be defeated. On October 12, 1946, after a short illness, stout-hearted Joseph Stilwell died. By his own instructions, ceremony was omitted. His ashes strewn out on the Pacific, whose waters play against the shores at beautiful Carmel. Today at West Point, the General's old campaign hat and combat boots are treasured mementos. There hangs, too, a portrait to recall Joseph W. Stilwell's career of service to his country. To the men he led, an example and an inspiration to greatness. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Walter Matthau. You will enter the continent of Europe and in conjunction with the other United Nations undertake operations aimed at the heart of Germany and the destruction of her armed forces. This was without a doubt the most difficult assignment ever given to one man. The brilliance with which he answered this awesome challenge marks him as one of our greatest soldiers. Mr. Raymond Massey, the distinguished actor, now brings you some of the finest moments in our history. 
the story of General of the Army, Dwight D. Eisenhower. this moment on, the fate of the nation and the fate of General Dwight D. Eisenhower would be inextricably bound together. Abilene, Kansas, today, a busy and proud town of almost 7,000 people living in the heart of the western wheatland, is typical of the kind of town that comes to mind with the phrase, grassroots America. The mark of the past is on it, but it does not live in the past. Its streets and its buildings bear testimony to a living and growing America. One of its newest and proudest buildings is the Eisenhower Museum, which carries forth the spirit and the history of the Eisenhower family of Abilene. It is visited daily by citizens from all parts of the country, ranging from dignitary to schoolboy. Inside the museum, the life of Dwight Eisenhower, boy and man, is depicted in a series of murals. From infancy, that life had the flavor of grassroots America about it. Eisenhower was born in 1890 in Denison, Texas, of parents whose families had migrated to Pennsylvania from Europe and thence to the American Midwest. Young Eisenhower's parents had lived in Abilene before his birth, and it was to Abilene, once the wild town at the end of the Chisholm Trail, now a peaceful village of the plains, that they returned when he was an infant. And it was here that he grew to maturity through a childhood that was active, eager, and happy. An experience shared with devoted parents and spirited brothers. A childhood as rich in the important things of life as ever graced the development of any man. It was an active boyhood in which sports played an important part. He excelled at baseball, both in school and on a vacant lot next to his home. But football was his first love, and his high school coach called him the most outstanding tackle in the valley. The active life was important, but the greatest single staple of the Eisenhower family life was religious observance. The family home in Abilene shows the influence of that serious religious conviction. The Bible was the guide of family life, and its chronicler as well. On the wall of the bedroom shared by Dwight and his brother Edgar still hangs this simple testament of faith, thy will be done. It was a home of patriotism as well as faith, and of respect for things of the mind. Work, constant and hard work, was also a staple of the family routine. The creamery where young Eisenhower worked during his spare time while he was in school is still one of Abilene's light industries. In this way and by these standards, young Dwight Eisenhower grew to a manhood the world would one day know well. He was 20 when he left Abilene for the military academy at West Point. Many a great American has begun his march into history as a cadet on the plane at West Point. Eisenhower was graduated from the military academy in 1915 and commissioned a second lieutenant of infantry. A 
new phase of life was beginning. In the summer of 1916, as a newly promoted first lieutenant stationed at Fort Sam Houston, Texas, he married Mamie Geneva Dowd of Denver. Events in Europe were forging a new phase of life for the entire world. World War I gave many a future general his first experience with combat. But young Eisenhower was not among them. World War I brought him instead command of a tank training center at Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, where he prepared troops of the new tank corps for overseas duty. His performance won for him the Distinguished Service Medal, but before he was able to get to Europe, the war ended. In the late 1920s, after graduation from the Command and General Staff School, Major Dwight D. Eisenhower was assigned to France to prepare a guidebook on American battlefields in Europe. It was his first direct experience with that continent. With the 30s came other assignments, climaxed by service under General Douglas MacArthur in the Philippines. For four years, he worked with MacArthur, who was commander-in-chief of the Philippine Army, to help the Commonwealth government work out a plan for its military defense. Ordered back to the States in December 1939, Lieutenant Colonel Eisenhower went to Fort Lewis, Washington, as executive officer of the 15th Infantry Regiment. In the dark spring of 1940, German armored divisions were crashing through Holland and Belgium. The Luftwaffe was streaking its destruction through Europe's skies. France was prostrate, and beleaguered Britain was standing alone. The United States had passed the Selective Service Act to prepare for what inevitably lay ahead. And the biggest challenge in Colonel Eisenhower's life was to aid in that preparation. Late in 1940, he was made Chief of Staff of the 3rd Division, where his staff work brought him assignment as Chief of Staff of the 9th Corps. In the summer of 1941, Colonel Eisenhower became Chief of Staff to General Walter Kruger, whose newly organized 3rd Army was preparing to participate in the most realistic war maneuvers yet held by American troops. In these maneuvers over the Louisiana countryside, as America fought for the time to train its growing army of citizen soldiers, Eisenhower's task was to work out a plan of defense against an invading mechanized force. Soon after the maneuvers were over, Eisenhower was promoted to Brigadier General, and within a matter of days came the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Almost this moment on, the fate of the nation and the fate of General Dwight D. Eisenhower would be inextricably bound together. Called to Washington in the first weeks after the war began, Eisenhower went to work in the War Plans Office of the War Department. Among the plans formulated during this time was the central strategic determination to make an eventual attack across the English Channel the principal Allied offensive effort. A mural covering the west wall of the Eisenhower Museum dramatizes the high spots of the next great sequence in the adventure involving the nation and the man, whose ability to rise to grave responsibilities brought him rapid promotions. Because an all-out channel invasion would be impossible before 1944, and because the need for offensive action was immediate in 1942, the Allies undertook, as a combined operation, under the command of General Dwight D. Eisenhower, the invasion of North Africa. The minimum objective of this maneuver was to seize the main ports between Casablanca and Algiers.
rim of the North African coast, troops were ashore in late November, encountering resistance ranging from mild at Algiers to surprisingly stiff at Casablanca. The commander's hope was to push quickly east along the Mediterranean and take the important posts of Bizet and Tunis. But a number of unfavorable circumstances, including treacherous weather conditions, prompted the commander to hold off on this vital assault. In the spring, however, troops of Omar Bradley's 2nd Corps were able to take Bizet, and at the same time, Tunis fell to the British 1st Army. And with these victories came the end of the Axis Empire in Africa. The Allied leaders and the men who had fought under them proudly commemorated their victory. One of the greatest products of this victory, in the words of the commander himself, was the progress achieved in the welding of Allied unity and the establishment of a combat team that was already showing the effects of a growing confidence and trust among all its members. General Eisenhower called upon all troops to rise to new heights of courage and effort. The brave men of the beleaguered forces held and steadily began pressing the enemy back. With these victories, although heavy fighting and important battles lay ahead, the first major objectives of the Italian campaign were accomplished. Allied forces were on European soil and would be able to pin down German troops far from the scene of the cross-channel invasion planned for the following year. President Roosevelt visited the combat area with General Eisenhower when he came over for the Cairo and Tehran conferences, where agreement was once again established that the principal Allied effort would be the invasion of Europe. Shortly afterward, the man who would command this awesome undertaking was named General Dwight D. Eisenhower, whom people throughout the free world were now calling the Man of the Hour. On the opposite wall of the museum, another mural depicts some of the major episodes in the Great Crusade which liberated Europe. The Supreme Commander's orders from the combined Chiefs of Staff were quite simple to land on the coast of France and thereafter to destroy the German ground forces. Between the order and its execution lay an agony of effort. Across the channel, the heavy fortifications lining the coast of France bespoke the Nazis' belief that they could push the invading armies back into the sea. In France alone, 58 German divisions were waiting. Preparing for the invasion was a job without let-up. Incessant and realistic training was of paramount importance. The challenges of morale, the myriad details of coordination on every level, all these were overwhelming. But through those tense months in the early part of 1944, the preparations continued. And finally, after being postponed one day because of weather conditions, the eve of the day of decision was at hand. The commander visited the airborne troops who would lead the invasion. I found the men in fine fettle, he wrote later, joshingly admonishing me that I had no cause for worry. D-Day with the fate of the war hanging in the balance.
half a million troops, backed by millions more, faced outward across the stormy sea. On beaches that dotted the French coast of the Channel, British, Canadian, and American troops touched shore. The first fateful moment passed, and Allied troops were holding on French soil. One week after the landings, the commander was able to say to the vast armies under him, your accomplishments in the last seven days of this campaign have exceeded my highest hopes. Less than two months after the invasion, the Allied force broke out of the beachhead perimeter in the hedgerow country around St. Lo. Exploitation of the breakout was the next step. And now there began the dramatic pursuit, spearheaded by General George S. Patton's armored force across the heart of France. And then the grand triumphant march through Paris, which was freed by French troops and soldiers of the U.S. Fifth Corps. Beyond Paris lay the liberation of Belgium and the yard-by-yard -yard struggle across the German border. Blocking the steady pursuit of victory lay the Nazi counter-offensive in the Ardennes sector, known as the Battle of the Bulge. Through a grim and bleak period of several weeks, the enemy, supported by the most devastating of weather conditions, isolated and assaulted Allied forces. General Eisenhower called upon all troops to rise to new heights of courage and effort. The brave men of the beleaguered forces held and steadily began pressing the enemy back. And from that moment onward, the Supreme Commander counted on weakened Nazi resistance. The bridge at Remagen across the Rhine, one of the sturdiest symbols of the war. With this crossing in March 1945, the heart of the enemy's defenses was cracked. There remained the substantial task of mopping up what was left of the enemy west of the Rhine. And accepting his surrender in the droves that began to appear. The great cities of the enemy's fatherland were rubble as Allied troops moved through them in the last stages of the enemy's defeat. Both Commander and G.I. were able to find the exaltation that comes when victory is close. Victory came finally with the German surrender in a schoolhouse at Reims on May the 7th, 1945. The return to peace was signaled by the Supreme Commander. I have the proud privilege of speaking for a victorious army of almost five million fighting men. They, and the women who have so ably assisted them, constitute the Allied expeditionary forces that have liberated Western Europe. They have captured or destroyed enemy armies totaling more than their own strength. Merely to name my principal subordinates in the Canadian, French, American, and British forces is to present a picture of the utmost in efficiency, skill, loyalty, and devotion to duty. The United Nations will gratefully remember Tedder, Montgomery, Spatz, Bradley, Lilat, Creer, and many others. But all these agree with me in the selection of the truly heroic figure of this war. He is G.I. Joe, 
and his counterpart in the air, the Navy, and the Merchant Marine of every one of the United Nations. He has braved the dangers of U-boat infested seas. He has surmounted charges into desperately defended beaches. He has fought his tedious, patient way through the ultimate in fortified zones. He has endured cold, hunger, fatigue. His companion has been danger. Death has dogged his footsteps. He and his platoon commanders have given us an example of loyalty, devotion to duty, and indomitable courage that will live in our hearts as long as we admire those qualities in men. And now, the long and happy road home. For Dwight Eisenhower, that road was paved with the cheers of the people of the Allied countries. In his own homeland, a hero's welcome awaited him. America's greeting for a favorite son. Here, the story of Dwight D. Eisenhower might well have ended, on this note of triumphant acclaim for a job so splendidly done. But America had other tasks waiting for its favorite soldier. Eisenhower succeeded General Marshall as the Army's first post-war chief of staff. He expressed the belief that one of the greatest pillars of world peace is a strong United States. He visited troops stationed in various parts of the world to show America's growing sense of global responsibility. We must remain, he said, the first champions of those who seek to lead their own lives in peace with their neighbors. Finally, on February the 7th, 1948, the general from Abilene, after 36 years of service to his country, left active military assignment. But not active participation in the life of his nation. He accepted an invitation from Columbia University to serve as president of that great institution, enabling him, so he thought at the time, to devote the remainder of his useful life to the challenges of education. But events of the post-war world dictated otherwise. The urgent necessity for unity in the free world brought into being the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. And it was evident that only one man could make that vital and complicated organization work from the outset. Dwight D. Eisenhower. At the end of 1950, he answered his country's call once more. And once more, he was on European soil to assume supreme command of the land, the sea, and the air forces of a grand defensive alliance. Against the new threat rising from the Soviets, who had once been his nation's ally, he had to create in the war-weary European soul the will to defend itself so that freedom so dearly bought would not be lost. For more than a year, he labored diligently at his task of coalition. When he turned over the reins of command to General Matthew Ridgway, the structure of military unity among free nations, on which rested the hope for continued peace, was established. Once again, with the accomplishment of substantial victory behind him, this might well have been the end of his public career, and in a sense it was, the closing chapter in the story of Eisenhower the soldier. History is recording today the story of Eisenhower the statesman. The stories may be separate, but soldier and statesman, they are the same man, Dwight D. Eisenhower, citizen of the United States, spokesman for and symbol of the free world. And son of Abilene, as rich a study as this nation has produced of the capacity for greatness which lies at its grassroots.
ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Walter Matthau. Great men hallow a whole people and lift up all who live in their time. Such a man was General of the Army George Catlett Marshall. Recognized as one of the great military planners of all time, he contributed the design for victory in two world wars. After his military career, he enlisted in the service of all mankind. He served brilliantly in this capacity until his death in 1959. Among his many contributions in this area was the Marshall Plan. This expression of brotherhood and humanity was the instrument for European post-war recovery. He was a man of honor and of truth, a soldier in the finest sense of that word. Mr. Walter Cronkite, the distinguished commentator, now brings us his story. During the 30s, the world caught fire, ignited by a handful of global arsonists who enjoyed their work. Germany threatened to even the score for her defeat in 1918. A distinguished faculty at the Fort Benning Infantry School, which included future generals Bradley, Stilwell, and Collins, was under Marshall's direction from 1927 to 1931. When he took over the school, one of the most important in the army, he found much of the instruction had fallen behind the time. But this hard-driving man with the passion for facts was not satisfied to refight old wars. It was the present and the future which concerned him, and he revised the curriculum accordingly. During the 30s, the world caught fire, ignited by a handful of global arsonists who enjoyed their work. Germany threatened to even the score for her defeat in 1918. On the other side of the world, the Japanese were introducing their neighbors to their own brand of arson. China felt the brutal aggression directed by the Japanese warlord. The Japanese onslaught of China carried out the ambitions and aspirations of a nation bent on territorial conquest. many of us laughed at a comic opera character speaking from a Roman balcony. But his intended victims in Ethiopia did not laugh. They were a proud and fierce people determined to resist the Italian dictator's aggression. Benito Mussolini invaded the tiny African kingdom anyway, and another piece of earth caught fire. An appeal was made, but no one came forward to answer it. Mussolini demonstrated for his friends how easy it was. The day Germany invaded Poland, George Marshall, then a brigadier general, made the extraordinary jump from one to four stars to become the army chief of staff. With Secretary of War Stimson, the task of mobilization lay ahead. The resources of a mighty nation had to be tapped to produce the props for the great drama about to unfold. Marshall had waited in the wings for 20 years for the role he was about to play. The country's manpower resources, the great citizen army in which Marshall believed so deeply, had to be activated, trained, and equipped to fight if necessary. And with each passing month in 1940 and 41, it appeared increasingly probable that the United States would be drawn into the war. The army numbered less than 200,000 men when Marshall took over as chief of staff, it would swell to more than eight million before the Axis defeat. The accumulated experience from the early days in the Philippines, Cantigny, and the Meuse Argon, from the staff work with Pershing and the seasoning in China, from Fort Benning to the National Guard and the CCC during the Depression. The sum total was imaginatively applied by George Marshall 
in directing the American army during the war. It was as if every single year of his career in some way related to the monumental task he undertook. The American military buildup was just beginning to gain momentum when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. At an inspection of the Army's new airborne troops at Fort Bragg in 1942, Marshall gets a close-up view of the citizen soldier at work. Field soldiers never knew when the chief of staff might make an appearance such as this one at the Jungle Warfare Training Center in Hawaii. Marshall might do his thinking and planning in Washington, but it was from the field that he drew his facts. A gifted observer, the smallest detail did not escape him. Army subordinates were either proud or dismayed by Marshall's critical appraisal, depending upon the performance. Jungle training was a new experience for American troops, but it was clear from the beginning that in order to win the war in the Pacific, our soldiers had to beat the Japanese at their own game. In the forbidding gray of a November dawn in 1942, American naval vessels ghosted in toward the beaches of North Africa, delivering the first major Allied counterattack since the outbreak of the war. Their objective? the German Africa Corps in Tunisia. The enemy was led by Germany's ingenious Field Marshal Erwin Rommel, the Desert Fox. His veterans already had been baptized by the battle-toughened British Tommy. Desperately, with everything they had, the Germans fought to keep from being pushed into the sea. When the Allied military advisors convened at Casablanca in January 1943, the North African campaign had become tough and bitter, but the achievement of a unified Allied command was part of the ultimate victory. Marshall had worked tirelessly to achieve a smooth-running command organization at the highest American level. He held the president's trust and regard and was consulted on every critical decision affecting the conduct of the war. Marshall's diplomatic skill helped reconcile many opposing points of view with British leaders during the Casablanca Conference. From the North African meetings came the Allied decision to bomb Germany around Plum. American B-17s helped carry the war to the German backyard. The decision to invade Sicily also was reached, and in July of 1943, Americans and British jumped off from Africa on the preliminary leg to the first assault on Fortress Europe, the Italian mainland. A strong partisan for the Women's Army Corps, as important to our mobilization, the Chief of Staff made it a point to be in Washington the day Colonel Ovita Kop Hobby was sworn in as its new commander. By the time the Allied leaders convened at Cairo in December 1943, the Italian campaign was well underway and the war against the Japanese demanded stepped-up operations. The future of the China-Burma-India theater and the problem of harnessing China's manpower had to be resolved. At Tehran, Marshall took part in planning joint strategy with the Russians. Soviet demands for an expanded second front were addressed to the United States. It was George Marshall who answered them. When the Chief of Staff visited the Pacific Theater on his return from Tehran, our offensive was gaining speed. Island by island, we were moving in on Japan. At Good Enough Island in 1944, Marshall listened to a first-hand report on the successful operations in the Gilbert Islands and the planned invasion of the Marshall. Marshall conferred with General Douglas MacArthur, theater commander, as the Allies were gearing for the big Pacific push which would carry them to the very doorstep of Japan. Italy had become a slow and painful struggle. The road to Rome was a long one, and for Marshall and his wife, one of extreme personal anxiety. The tank commander under Patton, 
Marshall's stepson had been engaged in the heaviest fighting for weeks. When the Americans finally broke through the lines of a stubborn enemy, the young officer fought his last fight. For General Marshall, the war had turned into a personal tragedy. When the spring of 1944 brought the long-planned invasion of France, Marshall accompanied General Eisenhower and other high-ranking officers ashore for an inspection of the American positions on the Normandy beachhead. Fifteen stars fill this corporal's jeep as Admiral King and Generals Marshall, Bradley, and Eisenhower ride out to survey the battle damage. On this trip, Marshall takes a few moments to visit an old friend, the colorful ex-cavalryman Patton, whose fast-moving armored columns had many times torn great holes in the German defenses. Marshall considered Patton one of the ablest field commanders in the army, and the chief of staff had personally ordered the mercurial general to his original combat assignment in North Africa. The subsequent performance of the troops under Patton's command confirmed General Marshall's wise choice. Allied planners met again in 1944, this time at Quebec. A decision was reached to move the invasion of the Philippines three months ahead of schedule. Marshall returned from Quebec to fly immediately to Paris with Secretary of State James Byrne for another meeting with General Eisenhower. The Chief of Staff was involved with the vast and complicated problem of our global supply line, and he chose to inspect the divisions poised for the final thrust into Germany. A minor slack in the line of supply at this moment could cause a major military disaster. And Marshall knew all these facts at both ends of the line. The price of victory was far too high to risk delay. The peculiar circumstances of the conflict called for the existence of large American forces without total mobilization in the United States. Once more, George Marshall, the statesman, distinguished himself. The trip to Europe provided Marshall with another opportunity, a chance to talk with the troops. He spoke informally to American soldiers who had faced the toughest test in history and triumph. Marshall inspected their positions within range of the enemy, his last close look before the Axis collapsed. World War II ended with the final capitulation of Japan. When President Truman presented Marshall with the Distinguished Service Medal in 1945, he said that although millions gave America extraordinary service, Marshall gave it victory. 1945 also saw Marshall dispatched to China as the president's special representative to negotiate a truce between Chiang Kai-shek and the communists. General Eisenhower, then chief of staff, visited his former boss during the negotiation. This was the first time Marshall officially functioned as a diplomat, but the role was not unfamiliar. Although the army had been his profession, his country's interest had always been his career. Marshall received the oath of office as Secretary of State from Chief Justice Vinson early in 1947. The president enthusiastically endorsed the former chief of staff at a critical time in history. It was fairly said that Mr. Truman selected him not because of his experience, but because he was Marshall. There's nothing that I can say at this time regarding matters that pertain to my position in the State Department. But I assume the duties with a great, with a feeling of great responsibility and a very earnest desire to carry out the foreign policy of this government in the manner that uh, has been so uh, splendidly exemplified by my predecessor, uh, Mr. Burns, my old friend. 
The new secretary brought imagination and a dignified intensity to his job, which was equal to the world challenge. In March 1947, Marshall headed a delegation to Moscow, whose mission was the peace agreement on Germany and Austria. The opportunity to observe the Russian bear in his native environment was valuable in view of increasing Soviet hostility. Russia already loomed as the largest question mark in America's future. The desperate economic plight of Europe drew Marshall's whole attention upon his return, and his recommendations were presented to the Congress. Europe is still emerging from the devastation and dislocation of the most destructive war in history. Within its own resources, Europe cannot achieve, within a reasonable time, economic stability. The solution would be much easier, of course, if all the nations of Europe were cooperating, but they are not. Far from cooperating, the Soviet Union and the Communist Party have proclaimed their determined opposition to a plan for European economic recovery. Economic distress is to be employed to further political ends. There are many who accept the picture that I have just drawn but who raise a further question. Why must the United States carry so great a load in helping Europe? The answer is simple. The United States is the only country in the world today which has the economic power and productivity to furnish the needed assistance. The six and eight tenth billion proposed for the first 15 months is less than a single month's charge of the war. To be quite clear, this unprecedented endeavor of the new world to help the old is neither sure nor easy. It is a calculated risk. It is a difficult program. And you know far better than I do the political difficulties involved in this program. But there's no doubt whatever in my mind that if we decide to do this thing, we can do it successfully. The great rubble heaps left by the war were soon diminished by an American investment in international friendship and goodwill, which also proved to be an effective economic weapon against spreading communism, the Marshall Plan. Offered on a self-help basis, Marshall Plan aid enabled many war-ravaged countries to regain their first foothold on a stable peacetime economy. Trade and production were stimulated, and communist plans, which were dependent upon poverty and despair for their success, were thwarted in many parts of the world. George Marshall resigned as Secretary of State in January 1949, intending to relax for the first time in almost 50 years. But the National Red Cross called upon him for one further task in the public interest when it asked him to serve as its head. Meeting with Folio Foundation Chief Basil O'Connor at the White House, Marshall outlined his plans for this vast mercy organization. Less than one year later, the president persuaded him to return to the government as Secretary of Defense. He flew to Korea, where he met with General Ridgway and other UN leaders. The man with the passion for facts was gathering them firsthand. This was a different American army than Marshall had known, and a different kind of war. The citizen soldier did the fighting in Korea, but this time under a UN banner and for a limited objective. Washington, Marshall assumed the critical responsibility for all of the men and material necessary for victory in Korea. The peculiar circumstances of the conflict called for the existence of large American forces without total mobilization in the United States. Once more, George Marshall, the statesman, distinguished himself. Relaxation was rare for the busy cabinet member, but to the delight of a pretty queen, he did manage to officiate at the Shenandoah Apple Blossom Festival in 1951. On the 50th anniversary of his graduation, VMI paid tribute to General Marshall with a day named in his honor. Many of his old classmates came to Lexington 
to applaud the school's most distinguished graduates and to recall their years as members of the cadet corps. After a howitzer salute to the soldier statesman, the entire body of cadets stood at attention while Marshall was awarded Virginia's Distinguished Service Medal by Governor John Battle. Then, the man whose life represents the highest ideals of the Cadet Corps inspected the ranks of men who may be tomorrow's leader. George Catlett Marshall resigned from the Defense Department and settled in Leesburg, Virginia in 1951. His public service spanned a critical half-century for our country, placing him in the ranks of great American patriots. 